Uh, so first of all, as your host, I'm delighted to welcome you with Samir's permission. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of saving my wisdom for the last session of this conference. But I do want to say that uh, when you look at disruptive transitions, uh, certainly in Delhi, the Rizina dialogue has been very disruptive and very much of a transition. Uh, what it has done in many ways is to bring people from different parts of the world to India so that uh, it allows bigger conversations than Indians talking to Indians, which is not such a bad thing, but... Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, my, this is the third, third edition and my own sense is that this broader conversation has actually been very helpful uh, uh, for, for sort of widening, uh, broadening Indian minds uh, as we look out at the world and uh, uh, take on greater responsibilities. And now, uh, today, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing two speakers, uh, one between now and your first course, and the second in the break between your second course and desert. Uh, and the first speaker uh, uh, is uh, Mr. Konstantin Kosache. Uh, I met him uh, when I went to Moscow. He was good enough to receive me. He's the uh, head of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the, uh, in the Duma. And uh, I, I found him very engaging, very frank, very, uh, very uh, with, with a lot of views, uh, and uh, a lot, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it was really a conversation you carried away with you. Uh, so uh, I thought today uh, that the, the dinner would, be, uh, uh, would, would get off to a great start by listening to him, and he would be followed uh, after the uh, next course uh, by Mr. Hans Dahlgren, who's the State Secretary in the Prime Minister's office, dealing with uh, EU and international affairs. Uh, again, a person very steeped in international affairs. Uh, and these two uh, contrasting perspectives uh, would, after the inaugural address, uh, set the tone for uh, what would follow tomorrow. So with those words, may I request Mr. Kosachev to come on uh, stage and address all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this very kind presentation and uh, I hope I will not spoil the first course of this dinner, but I am sure I will deliver a rather contrasting speech to what the successor of mine, Mr. Dahlgren, will, will be talking about because I will speak uh, coming from the Russian perspective of what is going on here in Asia and Pacifics as well as more globally. Uh, there is no big news about uh, stating that the balance of forces uh, in the national international politics is constantly changing, but uh, I believe that nowadays uh, the world is in a stage of an unprecedented and uh, extremely large scale transformation and this transformation is uh, really disruptive. For us in Russia, the events of the last 25 years are associated with the end of the Cold War, but also with a disintegration of the collective system of our national security, which existed during the previous decades of the Soviet Union time. And uh, exactly after the end of the Cold War, we in Russia entered a period of uh, great expectations about a completely new era, free of nuclear weapons and free of uh, alliance confrontation. And our country later on uh, tried its best to follow the course of so-called new thinking for a new world declared originally by uh, Ma uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, but then uh, somehow followed up by both uh, Boris Yeltsin, as well as uh, by Mr. Vladimir Putin after entering into power. 
And we did made, make our best uh, for almost two decades, including, uh, among other things, a uh, strong commitment to obligations under every possible fundamental agreement uh, in the field of uh, security, uh, control of armaments and disarmament. And uh, definitely this is our commitment of today as well, but the uh, last two decades or 25 centuries whatsoever, I would never call a success story. The fact is that uh, in the West, the same period uh, after the end of the Cold War was perceived in a completely different way as the culmination of the centuries-old struggle for the sole leadership in the world. At first sight, concluded by an unconditional victory with the right to build up a unipolar security model. The well-known epigram or sentence, what is good for General Motors, good for America, uh, declared shortly after the end of the Second World War, has rapidly been uh, transformed into the slogan, what is good for America, good for the whole world. And in this sense, the uh, political program of the current president of the United States of America, Mr. Donald Trump, America first, in my mind, uh, does not uh, shift uh, from the programs of his predecessors while frankly revealing the unchanged essence of these programs. Here in Asia, the development of uh, events in the 19th and most of the 20th century passed in the logic of the so-called third world, largely dependent on what is happening, was happening in the first two worlds and in the intercourse between them. Yes, of course, the most significant events here in Asia were at least as much and maybe more important, but almost each of them had either subnational or subregional significance not greatly affecting the course of the world events. That what was the previous logics of the global developments. Beyond any doubt, this period has remained in the past. Beyond any doubt, what happens now in India, in China, on the Korean Peninsula, without mentioning Afghanistan and Pakistan, the more so about Iran, Syria, Iraq, Libya, or Turkey, or Israel, is not just meaningful in terms of global security and cooperation. The relevant processes are radically and rapidly changing the picture of the modern world, in some cases generating new challenges and threats that have not been seen before, in others creating yet unknown opportunities for the development of the whole mankind, which could not be worked out either separately or together by the so-called West and East in the 20th century. Noting the geopolitical shifts uh, simultaneously on several axes of coordinates, I cannot help noting that with deep regret that the world today, from the standpoint of uh, uh, opportunities for cooperation and mechanisms for real insurance of security for national states, differs from the situation uh, of 20 or 30 years ago, rather for the worse, not for the better. The traditional threats of uh, interstate conflicts over territories and resources have been uh, either replaced or supplemented by the fundamentally new challenges of the cross-border propaganda, propaganda of extremist ideologies, uncontrolled and illegal migration, the creeping spread of nuclear technologies, and the global terrorist threat. Why did that happen? Uh, the fact is the world order for the first time in the modern history of mankind is changing faster than those organizations which are supposed to serve it. The transition to the new state of affairs after the end of the Cold War was not accompanied by global organizational changes compared with inter alia the creation of the United Nations after the end of the Second World War. At the end of the 20th century, the institutions of the former period were not 
been removed and were not being replaced, but were simply converted from the Western to universal ones. They should have been converted, but in fact, they remained and still remain under the strong influence of the West, fixing the unipolarity which contradicts with the objective processes of our age. Therefore, the crisis of the world system is, uh, for me, first of all, the institutional crisis. And the established institutions clearly need to be replaced not just by the more relevant ones, but I would say by the working ones, to keep it simple. I can take only one ex European example, the Ukrainian crisis, where verbally all European structures have failed both at the stage of prevention of this conflict and the settlement stage. But the same applies to the nuclear non-proliferation regime, which is unable to cope with the new situation related to the implementation of the relevant programs in many countries, not to main, mention them by name, but one is to be mentioned, this is definitely uh, North Korea and which is definitely a global threat to, uh, to the uh, security of mankind. But of course we have many other uh, problems and among others, uh, the unratified uh, treaty on uh, ban on testing nuclear weapons, which has not entered into power and there are many reasons why it is, has not entered into power, but I believe that the non-ratification by the United States of this treaty is one of the most important elements of this situation. Uh, anyhow, the shapes of the new world today uh, do not look obvious. They are not predictable. But nevertheless, we are at the edge of a new phase where many new players start to make global history or contribute to that making. It is already obvious that the attempts of uh, the West to block the activity of competitors through sanction sanctions and other unfair measures have caused an opposite effect. The genuinely independent and democratic structures, political, economic, including development banks, have become established. More and more countries began to switch to their own currencies and mutual settlements, and so on and so forth. And I believe that attempts to use the force mechanisms in order to contain other competitors are uh, doomed to failure. The political climate on our planet uh, will definitely stay disrupted for a long time, but I believe that uh, the major trend is that we are getting out of the bounds of uh, the unipolarity, which had been imposed on, on, on our uh, relations in many decades. At the end, we uh, need to uh, come to a different world, which will be the relations in this world, world should be guaranteed by the international law, which is of crucial importance. And of course, uh, giving, providing uh, better choice for each country, a uh, world where sovereign states will in reality not just by declarations make their decisions uh, by themselves. And that's what is happening. We are witnessing uh, the gradual displacement of the economic and political center of the world to this specific region. And uh, I believe that the result of the 21st century will be written not in the Euro-Atlantic in the first hand, but here in the Asia-Pacific region. And this is why the new dialogue formats uh, from the G20 to uh, BRICS, from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to uh, long proven format of APEC are so much welcomed. Last June, uh, the president of Russia, Mr. Putin, launched an initiative to create a fundamentally new economic architecture in Eurasia, the large Eurasian partnership, involving a wide range of states and integration 
associations. The establishment of a system of bilateral and multilateral trade arrangements is considered in Russia as the main instrument for the implementation of this initiative and uh, hopefully this initiative will be uh, completed with a, a series of uh, bilateral agreements, among uh, them the agreement on a free trade zone between the Eurasian Economic Union and India. Uh, as we have already taken this decision to start that kind of negotiations. Big Eurasia is a large scale and a long term a conceptual project aimed at the coming decades, probably not centuries, but definitely decades. Uh, Russia, India, other strategic partners here in Asia Pacific region uh, have to set ambitious goals that give the chance for each and every civilization, civilization, I would repeat it, to become a driver, self-sufficient driver for the global development, but working together. The new development of Asia makes it possible to transform this region from the space of former tough rivalry into a zone of cooperation and development that could become a center of the world development and attraction of financial resources, goods, and people. I believe that by the middle of the next decade, the world will be already completely different from the existing one. And I am absolutely sure that it would have been a huge mistake to uh, ignore or underestimate the current processes which do take place here. And my final uh, words would be that only by combining the efforts of all countries we could listen to uh, Mr. Netanyahu a little bit earlier on and he was very much concentrated on a necessity to build up a kind of a community of uh, democratic countries and I do share this idea but I believe that each and every country represented at this conference has a known idea about what is more or less democratic and each and every country would consider itself as a democratic one. So for me, the uh, uh, success story would uh, become a reality only if all countries of the region and more globally would uh, combine their efforts to ensure the real stability in our common world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Foreign Secretary, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I really want first to thank you, Mr. Foreign Secretary, for uh, hosting us all here tonight for this uh, delicious dinner. But let me also pay a tribute to the service that you are heading as the Foreign Service of India. I'm sure that many of us here have had a lot of experience of uh, meeting Indian diplomats in the field, of um, negotiating texts with them or organizing joint actions of all kinds. Not always easy, perhaps, but always with appreciation of the professionalism and the skill and the uh, dedication of these uh, men and women who represent and serve India abroad. The growing role of India on the global scene, I think is appreciated by so many, and not least by my own country, Sweden, and by the European Union, as we share a community of values, a strong commitment to democratic institutions, to the rule of law, to human rights. We are, of course, tremendously uh, impressed by the Indian economy retaking its place now as the world's fastest growing large economy. But I also wanted to pay tribute to the commitment to multilateralism that has marked India's foreign policy throughout the years. The world knows your nation as a strong advocate of global cooperation, 
within the framework of the United Nations. Historically, you have contributed, I think, more personnel to the UN peacekeeping missions than any other nation in the world. And I have seen, Mr. Foreign Secretary, that you yourself spoke at the Raisina Dialogue last year about India being a, what you said, a natural exponent of multilateralism. And that it was inconceivable that a world as vast and as diverse as ours could be run by a small set of powers through alliances. I believe that never before has this need for a multilateral approach been more evident than it is today at the start of 2018. When the threats to our security are broader and wider than ever, the need to work together with others to solve joint challenges is even stronger. I recall when uh, an Indian Prime Minister in the past, Indira Gandhi, in 1972, she came to Stockholm for the very first UN conference on the environment. And she spoke very forcefully about our joint responsibility for the global environment. The same signal, of course, came from Paris two years ago from world leaders committed to saving the planet from being destroyed by global warming. But we are still safe, still far from being safe on this field, of course. As the UN Environmental Organization recently told us, the global temperature will continue to rise, not by one and a half centigrade, not by two, but by more than three centigrades if we don't more, do more than has already been decided. And that can only lead to a catastrophe for this planet and for humanity. The theme for this year's Raisina Dialogue is managing disruptive transitions. And I fear that the most serious such transition right now is the deterioration of our climate. It is an existential challenge of our time, comparable in my mind only to another existential threat that is putting at risk the very survival of mankind, the development, the stockpiling, and the threat or use of nuclear weapons. And even if the number of nuclear arms has been radically reduced, there are now more fingers of the nuclear triggers than ever before. These days, the focus is, of course, on the Korean Peninsula, on North Korea's nuclear weapons program and the totally unacceptable threats to use these weapons against an adversary far away. These threats, and sometimes the counter threats, make the rest of us hold our breath. And I'd say recent reports, both from Washington and from Moscow, of greater reliance on nuclear arms do not provide any relief. Hopefully, as a result of the process that we have say, seen recently that started the talks on the Olympics, we can perhaps breathe a little more calmly. Mr. Foreign Secretary, let me turn to another transition that also needs to be managed and managed well. A year and a half ago, most Europeans were taken aback by the result of the referendum in the United Kingdom. Even those who advocated the UK to leave the, UAE, the European Union seemed surprised at the outcome. At least they were not very well prepared for that outcome. And, but for the rest of us in the European Union, this was also a wake-up call. Some even feared that this was uh, well, the beginning of the end in a way, that after all the difficulties of the financial crisis, after a migration crisis, after an employment crisis, our union might start to disintegrate, beginning now with the UK leaving. And there were also other worrying signs on the European scene. Populist sentiments grew stronger. Extremist parties drew larger followings. Citizens' trust in government was declining. And these saints just, signs, they just had to be taken seriously by European leaders. I think uh, at least in one respect they have succeeded. The EU27, 
the 27 that remain in the Euro will remain in the European Union, they have kept together. We have negotiated with the Brits as one entity. And there is now no member state in sight that wants to follow the United Kingdom out of the Union. We have also been united in our reaction to major world events. And uh, since uh, my friend Konstantin mentioned Ukraine, I can just take that as an example, how the EU has been united in its reaction to the illegal annexation of the Crimea and what's happening in Ukraine. There's also unit in, in the, the pleasure of seeing finally a positive growth in the European economy. And there is a, I would say, a promising debate now in Europe on how to improve the European Union. The French president has spelled out many interesting ideas and Germany have a new government soon. I'm sure that Berlin will also make a strong contribution. And in Sweden, in November last year, the EU leaders for the first time held a social summit, a social summit for fair jobs and growth. And it is my own conviction that only by taking on these issues that really matter for our citizens can the EU develop in a positive way. Which means more emphasis on growth and employment so that more people, particularly young people, will have a decent job to go to. It means this protecting the security of our citizens to combat terrorism and organized crime in a forceful way. And it means protecting our climate and the environment so that our planet will be livable also for generations to come. Mr. Foreign Secretary, I'm confident that all these issues will be dealt with thoroughly in the debates that follow in the coming two days. So let me conclude just by wishing us to all have a successful dialogue for the next 48 hours. Thank you.